Welcome to this uh, webinar, Taking Responsibility for Responsible Artificial Intelligence, that I am hosting together with my good colleague, Alexander Gerber. Uh, the, this webinar is a part of a co-creation project funded by the Research Council of Norway. Uh, it's called Responsible Research and Innovation in Horizon Europe. And it's about how to include uh, RRI perspectives into research funding. Um, my name is Ella Marie Forsberg. I'm the Managing Director and the Senior Researcher at NORSUS, Norwegian Institute for Sustainability Research. I'm also a philosopher by background and I have been working with ethics and governance of emerging technologies for the last 20 years. Today we have also uh, with us uh, Alexander Gerber, Professor of Science Communication at the Rheinwald University in Germany and also a partner in the in Psycho um, Consultancy on Science Communication. In the project we also have the partner Siri Granum Carson, who is a Professor of Philosophy at the Norwegian Technical University. So, uh, I have mentioned already uh, the concept of RRI. Uh, this is a conceptual framework for bringing responsibility into science and innovation. And it has mostly been applied to emerging science and technologies. I will say a few words uh, about RRI as it will come up later. Uh, but in the discussions today, we will not restrict ourselves to any particular framework, but instead discuss responsibility in different formats. Um, so what you see here is the European Commission's RRI philosophy that's been developed over the last 10 years. Um, there are also other approaches to RRI, uh, for instance, in the UK and in Norway, in, the re in research funders in, U in the UK and Norway. And uh, Cecilia will come back to that uh, a bit later. Uh, in the e European Commission, um, they also have the so-called RI keys, which are more specific policy agendas. But I would like to focus on the overall um, European Commission RI philosophy, which I quite like. Uh, they say that responsible research and innovation is an approach that anticipates and assesses potential implications and societal expectations with regard to research and innovation, with the aim to foster the design of inclusive and sustainable research and innovation. Uh, they further say that this implies that societal actors work together during the whole research and innovation process in order to better align both the process and its outcomes with the values, needs and expectations of society. So to sum up in bullet points, you could say that RRI is about that research and innovation should address societal needs and should avoid undesirable side effects. Um, responsibility should also be integrated into research and innovation practices. So that means that researchers and innovators and research institutions and funders uh, need to be responsible themselves. They cannot outsource that to society saying like, we, only, we only care about the science and society will have to deal with the other issues. So uh, RI emphasizes that the role of uh, and the responsibility of the agents in the research system. Uh, when that is said, transdisciplinary collaboration is good in RRI. That's a very important uh, aspect. Um, research and innovators should engage with society. Responsibility can be related to social, environmental, ethical, or political issues. This is the last webinar in a series covering responsibility in biotech, nanotech and ICT. And I'm not going to make a big argument about why we should consider responsibility with regard to artificial intelligence, as uh, our speakers in this uh, webinar will um, explain that in much more, much better than I can here. Uh, we will hear today a number of reasons why responsibility is important in research, development and use of artificial intelligence and how we can ensure this in practice. Uh, if you're interested though, you can visit the 
web page of our project with further resources about how to integrate responsibility and RRI into research and innovation. So because we had such a big response uh, to the uh, seminar, we unfortunately had to reduce the interactivity. So that means that you will need to send your questions and comments to the speakers via the Zoom chat, please. And we are recording this session and we'll post it on Narcissus YouTube channel. So this is the program for the webinar. We have five excellent speakers that will uh, present uh, today and then after that we will have half an hour for discussion with the panel. So with that um, I will just uh, introduce our first speaker Max Erik Tegmark from MIT. Um, Max Erik Tegmark is a Swedish American physicist professor at MIT and co-founder of the Future of Life Institute has been commissioned by Elon Musk to investigate existential risks of advanced AI. He has an international bestseller, Life 3.0, uh, which has triggered a vigorous debate ranging from journals like Nature and Science to the popular media. So please, Max, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So if you gave me 20 minutes, if I finish in a little bit less, will there be time for some Q&A? Yes. All right, great. Let me share my screen. So um, I'm delighted that we're here talking about using AI responsibly. And uh, since you have the words, had the word society very prominently in what you spoke about there, I'm gonna talk about democracy in particular, AI and democracy, and how we can use artificial intelligence to work for our democracy rather than against it. So did, did my slide just change or not? Yes. Yeah. There's just one thing I have to fix here. Let me try again, new share. All right. Did it change again? New slide? Good. So even though my background is in physics, I shifted my MIT research group entirely to focus on artificial intelligence some years ago because there's just so many exciting opportunities. It's, it's really remarkable, of course, how rapidly the power of, of AI has been growing. Just think about it. Not long ago, robots couldn't walk. Now, back not long ago, we didn't have self-driving cars. Artificial intelligence, right? Not long ago, AI couldn't do face recognition. Now it can simulate fake faces, and we worry about face recognition. Not long ago, AI could not save lives. Now it can do a great job diagnosing prostate cancer, lung cancer, many eye diseases. And just the other week, yet again, artificial intelligence did a huge breakthrough showing how it could solve the protein folding problem and accelerate drug discovery. So very, very exciting developments. And uh, even with quite advanced things like beating humans at the most difficult board game of Go, where Google DeepMind took 3,000 years of human Go games and Go wisdom and threw it all in the trash and became the world's best Go player by uh, just playing against itself for 24 hours. And the same thing learned to also play chess better than any human. And the interesting thing here really is not that the AI crushed human gamers, but that it crushed human AI researchers, people like myself who'd spent decades handcrafting these algorithms, which are now obsolete. So that's all great. But of course, any powerful technology can be used both for good and also for bad. And we've seen many problems with AI causing uh, racial bias by being used in courtrooms, for example, how excessive automation have, has actually killed people by making airplanes crash, 
when people hadn't understood the systems they deployed or crashing companies. Again, when systems weren't well understood or causing ha enabling hacking of various sorts. And coming back to the theme here, even destabilizing democracy like uh, Cambridge Analytica infam infamously um, showed us how to do. So the way I think about this challenge we have of, of making sure that uh, AI empowers democracy rather than destroys it is we cannot focus only on making AI ever more powerful. We have to also think about how we're going to steer this ever-growing power to, towards good uses and ask hard questions about where we want to go with this. And I look very much forward to discussions here with the rest of my esteemed panelists about this. There are, of course, many different ways in which artificial intelligence threatens democracy. Decades from now, perhaps we'll get so advanced artificial intelligence, super intelligence, that some humans or even machines can use that to subjugate the rest of us, which is about as undemocratic as it gets. But I want to focus the rest of, of my remarks here on the present, because right now we also have several ways in which AI is really threatening democracy. By the idea of democracy, to me, is that the power lies in many hands and therefore is used to make things better for everybody. Use of artificial intelligence for killing people can enable very few to kill very many, and we've seen very tragic examples of civilians getting killed, both in the Libyan civil war, it's going on now, and in Nagorno-Karabakh recently, for example, where the companies making these drones and the countries making these drones aren't even there in the conflicts. But because they have no skin in the game, you know, people die. Uh, another very important topic we can discuss is um, the extent to which artificial intelligence is fueling income inequality and what we can do about that, which is, of course, a major challenge to democracy. If very few people own everything, democracy doesn't work very great. <clears throat> and um, finally, and this is what I want to focus the rest of my remarks on, artificial intelligence is very good, not just at hacking your computers, but at hacking our minds. And for anyone who has any doubts about that, I highly recommend you go see the recent movie, The Social Dilemma. So let me tell you a little story to frame this. Suppose a patient shows up in the hospital and says, you know, I'm really feeling unwell. And the doctor notices that this patient has symptoms of fever, cough, or headache, and says, okay, got it. The problem is you have fever, cough, and headache. I'm going to give you ibuprofen or aspirin to get rid of these symptoms. Problem solved. Off you go. What do you think about this doctor? Is it a great doctor? It's a completely worthless disgrace of a doctor, right? Just treating the symptoms without diagnosing what's the root cause of this. In this particular case, this patient turned out to have COVID-19 and the correct treatment was actually not ibuprofen, it was steroids and maybe supplemental oxygen, right? Um, so I think the same <laughs> terrible mistake that this fictitious doctor is making, we are making when we diagnose another patient. Our democracy is obviously feeling unwell these days. We see many symptoms of this. Profusion of disinformation and ever more crude hate speech online, uh, people getting stuck in their own filter bubbles, unable to communicate, even with their neighbors, growing polarization in society and growing income inequality and growing anger at the establishment. So, so what do we do about this? <laughs> Mostly what we hear people say is, okay, yeah, fine. These are the problems. Let's treat these, this by just having machine learning that blocks disinformation and hate speech, problem solved. Maybe we should block the Russians and the Chinese and whatever else. And the, this is just as ridiculous as this example with a COVID patient I just mentioned. Just trying to treat the symptoms without first making a diagnosis and see what is causing this. And the, the central point I want to make today is that 
all of these things here have ultimately, I think, I believe the same root cause. The real diagnosis of what's wrong with our democracy here is we are being hacked by artificial intelligence. And I want to spend the rest of, of my remarks here just elaborating on this a bit, what I mean by it. You know, we all roll our eyes when people say things like, oh, the bots are coming to kill us, right? What I'm saying here is the bots are actually coming, but they're not primarily coming to kill us unless you happen to live in Nagorno-Karabakh. They're coming to hack us, right? And they've in fact already arrived. We are being incredibly hacked as the movie The Social Dilemma illustrates so, so well. And let's look at this a little bit more, more in a more nuanced way. All these artificial intelligence algorithms can of course make things worse, causing increasing polarization, but AI is also a technology that can help with this. We can see that things are incredibly polarized where I live. For example, only 6% of the people who watch Fox News are Democrats, but only 7% of the people who read New York Times are Republicans. So you see the filter bubble effect even spreading into uh, mainstream media. The hope comes from the fact that AI is not evil and it's also not morally good. It's a tool. We can use it for good and bad, right? So I'm incredibly interested in how can we use AI to empower the individuals and empower democracy. I've had a lot of fun working on exactly this with my research group at MIT with this great team of kids you see here. There are so many things you can do very easily with machine learning that let you detect when, when um, powerful companies and others are trying to manipulate you with AI. For example, if you look at these pictures, you don't have to look very long to see that the ones on the left side are much more flattering of Elizabeth Warren than the ones on the right. And if you read the fine print, you can see it's a very common strategy that newspapers that claim to be so unbiased in their journalism deliberately put ugly photos of, of politicians they don't like. Well, we show that we can measure this very easily with machine learning in real time. And it can alert you to these sort of things and hundreds of other little tricks that people do to you. Uh, one of the first things we did was we created a little news aggregator alternative to Google News because it's free. And um, let me just share a little bit of the ideas behind this. Improvethenews.org is a free news aggregator that lets you make up your own mind by reading a range of perspectives. I'm Max Tegmark, an MIT professor working on machine learning and physics. Can you hear this okay? I had the idea for improvednews.org because I agree with Einstein's quote that everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I feel that we should apply this to our news. Instead, media sometimes oversimplify and report things like a fairy tale, where one side is 100% good and the other side is 100% bad. Then machine learning comes along and gets us impulse clicking on these oversimplified stories, trapping us in hyper-partisan and hyper-nationalistic filter bubbles, creating an increasingly polarized world at a time when we instead need nuanced understanding that enables working together on great challenges. And we can see this polarization for many of the hundreds of topics tracked by improvednews.org. For example, let's scroll down to social issues, click on its header to see its subtopics, and scroll to immigration. Although there's much talk about fake news, an even bigger problem is oversimplifying by omitting key facts. And the best way to catch those omissions is to read both sides, which improved news makes very easy by simply sliding a slider. So uh, the, the goal of this particular little tool, the news aggregator, is to help people break out of their filter bubble and see when they've been manipulated into getting a, a very limited view of what's actually happening. Improve the And one point I mentioned there was uh, that uh, just like that hospital patient who came in with a fever, you don't want to just treat the fever, right? And I think today we're largely acknowledging that there's something very wrong with our media, but we're largely failing to make a proper diagnosis. There's so much talk about fake news where somebody claims something which just isn't true, but the opposite is just as important, where there's something that's true and it's not reported or claimed, right? 
In fact, I would say that's more prevalent. I mean, how, how many articles have you read about the tragedy in Yemen right now, for example, the biggest humanitarian crisis on earth where one child dies every 11 minutes? It's not covered very much, at least in American newspapers or Swedish, in Swedish newspapers, omissions. And if there were more coverage of this, the war would stop pretty quickly. In, in a democracy, democracies can, will only do bad things if people don't know about them. Uh, these, this diagnosis is complicated. Uh, there isn't this quick fix to this and just saying, okay, let's make algorithms that censor fake news because it's not so easy to know exactly what's true. If it were trivial to know what's true, we wouldn't need science. Science would be done, right? Um, and there are two common mistakes you can make here. One, there's a trade-off between anti-disinformation on one hand, which is, which is good, and censorship, which is bad, right? A trade-off between limiting real misinformation and freedom of speech. And nobody captured that better than George Orwell, who said that if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. This is a cornerstone of science, right? We always let people speak at conferences and say that I'm wrong. Uh, another interesting challenge to analyze here also is the trade-off between anti-disinformation on one hand, which comes from a good place, and propaganda on the other hand, which comes from a bad place. And George Orwell himself said that if you want to do disinformation, the first thing you should do is form an anti-disinformation ministry, right? And criticize everybody who criticizes you for spreading fake news and doing disinformation. And, we all remember, for example, how the fossil fuel lobby said that climate change was disinformation, the climate hoax. And Cambridge Analytica has even admitted using exactly this strategy. So just letting suddenly governments or big companies decide what's true goes totally against my instincts as a scientist as to how to best handle this. Imagine if you get a tweet 400 years ago from Galileo, you know, saying, hey, Earth revolves around the sun. And then now it gets fact checked by the Pope saying, no, no, I'm the authority here. This is fake news. You know, that's not the way we want to ha handle this. It's, it's a tougher problem. <laughs> and, and in fact, I love this recent article here by um, in the Journal of Public Health Research pointing out that one of the great pioneers of fake news is actually the, the tobacco industry. So, so why, why is it uh, helpful to give people the sort of tools that we're trying to make? Well, here's why I think it's helpful. So why is this useful for you? Improvethenews.org lets you choose your news diet the way you aim to choose your food. Deliberately, not impulsively. This way, you'll read the news that are most important to you. Most other news sites instead focus on showing you whatever their algorithm thinks you'll impulse click on to maximize your ad revenue. That's because they view your attention as their product to sell to their customers, their advertisers. Improvethenews.org is free with no ads because it's developed by academic researchers and powered by machine learning that draws no salary. So this artificial intelligence works for you, not against you. The AI auto-classifies the articles to help you find what you're interested in instead of auto-classifying you for advertisers. I developed these AI tools with an awesome team of MIT students for a summer research project and we've published them as open source. Improve the News.org is work in progress, so if you like it, please help us improve it by using its feedback form to send us bug reports, feature requests and ideas for making it even better. Thanks in advance. So in, in summary, the, my view on this is that artificial intelligence is an increasingly powerful tool and to really help it safeguard democracy and make it better rather than harm it, we should think about how we can use it to empower the individual rather than empower people who try to manipulate individuals. The things I showed you are just a few little examples that we've done with my research group, but this is a much, much bigger challenge. AI can help powerful companies manipulate democracy and powerful governments, or it can help individuals. If the latter is what dominates, then our democracy will thrive like never before. I'm going to end on this slide here. 
just trying to stir things up a little bit with a bunch of the questions that uh, you sent me with my initial reactions. Is Europe AI ready? Are we really equ equipped for responsible use of AI in Europe? <laughs> Absolutely not. We're, we're being very hacked by uh, and the companies doing it are largely not even European. And uh, how can we safeguard that AI research and innovation take democratic values into account? Well, by making sure that a lot of the decisions are made by democratic institutions like governments in Europe and not in boardrooms of companies or by just some unaccountable algorithms. And um, how can citizens be pr protected by impacts of AI that they aren't even aware of, even though they're negative? Both by improving democratic governance. So the governing bodies can find out about these problems and mitigate them. And also by media being better so that people can find out again when they're being hacked. Then you have this question about whether we can trust big tech to self-regulate. <laughs> My answer to that is ha ha ha, to the same extent that we could trust big tobacco to self-regulate. Not because I have anything against companies, but you know, companies are supposed to maximize their profit. They're not supposed to self-regulate. Uh, that's not their incentive. And finally, uh, what's the role of public and private funders? I think public funders should focus exactly on, on what the, the private funders, the companies won't fund long-term talent development and education, funding development of AI safety tools that are, very, that are open source to give away for free, research on smart regulation, and so on. So thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to, to uh, share my thoughts here. I can't hear you. I was I was saying thank you so much to you. Uh, it was a very interesting and thought provoking uh, presentation. Um, we let's just take one question very very quickly. Uh, we had a question in the Q and A. Um, recently, the head of Google AI Ethics, Timrit Gebru, was fired due to a controversy around the release of a paper damning Google and bias in AI mostly helping first world countries, what signal does that send globally? And is censorship part of the problem in manipulating democracy? Would you like to say a few words about that? Yeah, uh, I think that just perfectly illustrates the point I was making. Of course, you cannot trust the tobacco industry to self-regulate or the oil industry to self-regulate or big tech to self-regulate. Why would you? I think I have a lot of friends at Google and Facebook who are idealistic people and want to do good. But the, of course, the company itself, the companies themselves want to make money. That's, that's, the out, that's what they're trying to maximize for. And that's why it's really not Google's fault or for that matter, the tobacco industry's fault if bad things happen. It's society's fault for failing to have institutions that say, okay, this is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. Hmm. And, and Google and face, you know, the European Union put out this white paper recently for a GDPR for AI, which I think is great. If any part of the world will actually have effective AI regulation, it's gonna be Europe. And there's this, this massive lobbying happening by big tech now to, to sabotage this, right? And Google and Facebook put in these responses basically saying, oh, don't regulate us, trust us. Right. Yeah, thanks again, uh, Max. And this is a perfect bridge, I think, to, to the next speaker, uh, Virginia Dignam. Um, and um, we will come back to the uh, further questions uh, in the panel, uh, panel discussion. So, but I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Virginia Dignam at the University of Umeå. Um, at the, you're a professor of social and ethical artificial intelligence. Uh, you're an expert on statutory regulation of decisions made by agent systems on moral questions. And you are a member of the European Commission's high level expert group on AI uh, that have published two papers. I'm sure you will speak about. And you're a fellow of the European Artificial Intelligence Association and associated with Delft University of Technology. And you have recently published a book on responsible artificial intelligence uh, at Springer. So Virginia, we're looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say today. 
Thank you very much. I wouldn't say I'm an expert in statutory regulation, but I will do my best to say <laughs> something about regulation. <laughs> I'm a computer scientist, a, a pure, a, an engineer, but I, I work with a lot of people who know a lot about regulation. So I hope I can share uh, some of the, the work being done at the European Union, uh, in the high level expert group of the European Union, which by now finished, by the way, but uh, uh, we did indeed publish the regulation or the the guidance uh, for uh, trustworthy AI. Let me see if I can share my screen. Yep. Okay, so uh, this is work I'm doing mostly together with uh, Kathleen Muller at Alai. Alai is a, a small organization in mostly in the Netherlands in which we try to develop, to op operationalize and support others, operationalizing those nice words that come up in uh, regulation, uh, in uh, guidances and uh, uh, guidelines for um, for responsible AI, but what, how can we, all of us in the organizations, but in our lives, transform and operationalize and implement those nice words into concrete deeds. So that's part of the work is indeed related to, to regulation or to, um, to, uh, oper um, um, to operationalization of these issues. So the first thing which we need to talk about when we talk about regulating AI or uh, defining uh, or uh, uh, defining guidelines for AI or so on is what do we mean by AI? And in the, the white paper, which Max just referred to at the European Union, the way AI is defined, it's so broad that it can actually include any type of uh, uh, computer uh, program. Uh, so we really need to understand first, what do we want to regulate? Is that the technology? Is that the use of the technology? Is that the products that are developed based in this technology? Is that any AI technology? Is that specifically only the machine learning or the, 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 the non-deterministic type of systems, the systems that learn and that modify? So those are things which are at the baseline for understanding what are we, what do we want to regulate? Is that the magic or is that the business as, as usual or is something in between? And uh, depending on your answer, uh, the regulation will be quite different uh, and quite more or less possible. Uh, but uh, if we uh, continue, then it's uh, to, to regulate AI and we often talk about it from a very uh, European perspective in which we do trust, tend to trust our governments, we tend to trust our judiciary. But if we look at really the, the world situation, we really need to associate and to start discussing not only the regulation of AI, but also how governments, how the judiciary systems around the world are operating, are using or not AI to strengthen their uh, views, their perspectives, and how can we also use AI to strengthen the rule of law across the world and not just in Europe. So we really need to look at uh, a, not only the regulation of AI, not only the situation in Europe, but the much bro broader uh, situation across the world. Uh, Legally re relevant questions, and often people come with, yes, it's about the GDPR, is about data, uh, data governance, is about privacy, but actually there are much more uh, legally relevant questions that we should be asking as we talk about regulating AI. And again, like I say, starting by defining what are we regulating at all. Uh, it seems, is AI technology, is AI product some kind of an universal resource? Is there a human right to access to AI? Is that an access which is an individual right or is some kind of imposing uh, obligation on suppliers to supply AI in a certain way or in another way? Uh, how can we look at system errors or the failure to provide or other types of failures? Is that some kind of a criminal offense? Is that something which is already um, uh, covered by existing laws, by existing regulations? Or is this something which we really need to create different laws and different regulations? Uh, what, what are the, those uh, violations at stake? Are things which are already, like I say, co uh, covered by others, by GDPR, by security regulations, by product liability uh, regulations? So we really need to take a much broader approach to what are the type of legally relevant questions or regulatory questions about the 
the systems, the products, the results that or the, the use of AI that we are uh, regulating. And of course, are we regulating the development, the, the research about AI, or are we regulating the use of AI? And of course, like what uh, um, Max already referred, it's not just about AI and the rule of law, it's about AI and human rights. How can we use AI to improve, to support, to uh, contribute to uh, human rights, uh, um, universal human rights across the world, but also how are uh, human rights and how, are, how is AI affecting our current human rights? And do we need other human rights to, uh, in the era of AI, which we didn't get before. But things like the, the value of us, of humans, is that changing with AI? Uh, and of course, uh, taking a more uh, uh, general uh, artificial intelligent approach or view on the situation takes a different uh, discussion uh, in this issue than the case in which we just see AI as a business as usual, just the next step in digitization. But what is the intrinsic value of humans and how is that balanced and how is that uh, uphold in a world in which AI is regulating most of our interactions and most of our decisions? The, the, our freedom as individuals about uh, our choices, our options, our self-determination, our uh, freedom to decide or or not to use or not AI or any other technology. Issues, of course, of equality, non-discrimination, solidarity, bias, um, uh, uh, diversity, and so on. Uh, and of course, social and economic rights and how those are distributed and how is AI changing and shifting the distribution and the balance of social and economic rights across the world, across different uh, uh, regula uh, regulatory regimes. The issue of AI and democracy, which Max also already looked at it, uh, and will not really say much more. It, it's not only, uh, in my opinion, not only about the, the access to information, the voter influence, but it's also about the systemic risks of using AI to regulate lots of this type of systems which are making decisions for us. And also the issue of power concentration. It is uh, typically the large, uh, large tech, the large companies, uh, typically or by definition are not uh, institutions which are subject to uh, democratic uh, inspection to democratic process so they are uh, private companies and a lot of the power and a lot of the decisions around the world are more and more being concentrated in these companies which are not subject to the same democratic principles that we have uh, at least in most of the european uh, countries, we have our over our own uh, governments and our, our own uh, judiciary systems. And then finally, uh, how can we approach this? What are the kind of issues? How can we look at regulating AI? Uh, should we want to regulate AI? And what, again, like I say in the beginning, what are we regulating? Uh, things which uh, independently of those questions or not, we really should uh, or we really need to look at is what we call the question zero. Should we be using AI? Yes, we can use AI for a lot of, uh, a lot of things. Yes, AI can do a lot of uh, positive uh, contributions to society. But the question at every, every time, every moment in which an organization is considering applying AI technology for a certain uh, uh, situation, the first question should be, should we be using AI? Do we have other options? What are other options? And how can we balance and how can we justify the use of AI in whatever case? It's also about setting red lines. And uh, I'm not here saying which red lines should be set, but uh, it is about thinking and having a open, uh, transparent dialogue uh, between governments, citizens, uh, organizations, about where do should we put red lines and where should we be putting these red lines? And there are lots of discussions, especially around the military uses of AI, which in many cases are being seen as red line, uh, lines. But of course, the discussion needs to be uh, open and transparent this, this discussion. Uh, thinking about do we need to adapt human rights to the, the AI era, or uh, should we uphold and make sure that the 
current human rights need to be upheld in the future as well, uh, considering all types of future scenarios, uh, again, between the, the business as usual and the magic scenario. So uh, artificial intelligence under the rule of law or, or, or artificial intelligence and regulation, it's not just about the prohibitions and the restrictions on what we should be doing. It's mostly and foremost about how can regulation enable and support the responsible use of AI in a reasonable and pertinent way. So we really need to look much more at the regulations, not just at the constraints on innovation, but the stepping stones for innovation. AI, as we see it now, and all the technologies we have at this moment, are not static, are not the, the end of the development in AI, otherwise we wouldn't have no more science, no more development. AI in 10 years, in 20 years, in 100 years, will be very, very different from what it is today. And we really need to see these uh, regulations or the, the, inf the impact of AI in human rights rights and in democracy as the stepping stones for the development of other types of AI, which by definition and by uh, design include this type of issues. And I would like just to finish with one last uh, slide, uh, and that is to do with the fact that uh, regulating AI is not only about the, the laws, is not only about the the top down, but it's also a question for all of us in the same way that we all citizens have come together and have been increasingly aware of issues of climate change, of issues of, uh, in this case, organic and um, uh, animal welfare issues and start demanding this type of uh, developments, we as citizens, we as users, we as consumers also have the power to ask for AI that is aligned with our own values and our own perspectives. It doesn't mean that we all have to become experts in AI. We can look at it as we look at the free range X by providing some certifications and some uh, trust parties which are able to check for us and to provide us the options and the, the different different uh, alignments and the different types of values in the AI systems that we are using. Thank you. I think you are uh, unmute, if you are muted. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Virginia. That's a, that was a very interesting presentation. Uh, and again, we basically have no time for, for questions. Just a quick one from my side. I know there's been quite some discussion about uh, the participation in the higher level group. And um, uh, I was wondering, do you believe that there was a, a, an appropriate balance between this function of regulation as enabler and supporter, and on the other hand, uh, as a prohibitor and restrictor, is it? Would, Yes, in that in that aspect, I think we did add as a high level, as I expert group, we did add a good balance between the uh, the regulation and the enable or the the restriction and the enabler sides of regulations. We were not tasked with developing regulations. We were tasked with re developing requirements and guidelines for uh, trustworthy AI, which is in a sense a easier discussion when it goes about uh, enabling and restricting. Uh, so in that sense, I think that there was no, there was a good balance in the in the group. Maybe mm -hmm. that balance was not the same across all types of issues, but mm -hmm. in in the sense of the the perspectives on the regulation, I think the, the balance was quite uh, quite good. Okay, thank you very much again. Yeah. So um, let's move on to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, Luke Steele uh, from the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies. Uh, you were the founding director in 1983 of the Artificial Intelligence Lab at the Free University of Brussels and of the Sony Computer Science Laboratory in Paris in 1996. Uh, so you are a research professor currently at the ICREA uh, in Barcelona and you have co-founded the European Observatory on Society and Artificial Intelligence, and you are scientific director of the EU uh, Future and Emerging Technology Project 
Muhai, Meaning and Understanding and Human-Centric AI. So uh, please, look, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'm already sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, um, well, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for this uh, very interesting uh, seminar. Um, I, I, the time is brief, so I want to make three points. Uh, the first point is about um, uh, what, well, it's about what is AI, if you want, you know, and one, I think there is something that I would like to call fictional AI. I mean, this is uh, Frankenstein and, uh, you know, movies that you see in Hollywood and, and books and so on. And in a fictional AI, typically there are machines uh, who are like human intelligence, but not quite. So there's this uncanny valley. Uh, they are autonomous. They usually, they, they do something bad. There's a dystopian world. It's running out of hand. And also in some ways they are less uh, uh, powerful. In some ways they are more powerful than human intelligence. And because of fiction, uh, science fiction, you know, this is an idea that, that is in the mind of many people. Now, of course, real AI is, is very different from this. I think uh, real AI is actually about, uh, is a science of intelligence. And of course, we use the uh, computers and robots uh, to build artificial systems that exhibit uh, some form of in intelligence, but it's a scientific field and I want to stress that. Um, and what is this field about? Well, about perception, about motor control, behavior, action planning, language, understanding, language production, reasoning, you know, expert problem solving and so on, memory, logical inference, learning. So it's a bit like psychology. I would say it's a lot like psychology, except that psychology is mostly concerned with describing phenomena, whereas in AI, we want to understand the processes behind these phenomena. Okay, so this is a, this is a first point. Now, what you see often in, in discussions, certainly in the general public, but also in the media, is that these two things get messed up. And uh, what is the cause of this? Well, as I say in the media, I will give just one example. At some point, Facebook, posted uh, a small, you know, statements about an experiments they were doing in training AI agents to negotiate, okay? And as part of that experiment, these agents were developing some sort of communication system. Good. Uh, I mean, this was a little piece of work that uh, actually, I, I don't think there was any follow-up or there was any connection to the important work that has already been going on on the origins of communication, but those researchers did not know about it. Um, now then, if you go to the media, then th there's this uh, magazine called Fast Company, who has a headline, AI is inventing languages humans can't understand, should we stop it? And there's immediately a tone of danger, of something that happened, something very powerful has happened, and then when it goes further, you know, the next media picks it up and amplifies. This is from The Sun, a typical British newspaper. Um, Facebook shuts off AI experiment after two robots begin speaking in their own language. Um, no one can understand, okay? Experts have called the incident exciting, but also incredibly scary. Uh, and then a few pages further in the newspaper, it says, the incident closely resembles the plot of the Terminator in which a robot becomes self-aware and starts waging a war on humans. So this is this uh, continuous shift, you know, from, I would say, a rather trivial uh, AI experiment, uh, trying out an idea and in the media, then they, they put it in this fictional AI world. And this is how the public all the time gets kind of biased in, in, in terms of this, this mixing of those two. Um, now, one of the things is that um, AI is giving, in this fiction AI, I would say, AI is giving, being given of, uh, autonomy. 
is a kind of uh, even some sort of personality, you would say. And this is a typical uh, title in a, a newspaper, the AI that spots Alzheimer's from cookie drawing. This is from an article from the BBC, actually. Now, uh, notice here, the AI. I mean, you see, this is this, again, uh, mixing fiction with, with reality, because it seems to assume that AI has, a, has decision capability, has a kind of autonomy, which, which it doesn't have at all. And actually, then, if you look at the source of this, is an article in eClinical Medicine, a serious journal, uh, which says, linguistic markers predict onset of Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you read this article, the word AI does not appear. So this, this thing, this, this fiction which is created about the AI is doing this, the AI is doing that, um, is in, in my view, very confusing. Uh, and also if we start talking about ethical issues, legal issues, we should not fall into that trap. I mean, if you say, for example, AI is destroying democracy, well, of course, AI is used to destroy democracy. But the ones who are destroying democracy is not AI. It's Trump and the Republican Party and everybody, you know, in that circle. And so they are the ones that are responsible. So I think the term responsible AI, to me, is a bit bizarre. We should say responsible use of AI. And then we can talk about that. But the idea that we can make AI itself as being having quality so that it becomes responsible is again uh, messing up reality and, and fiction, you know, that AI is more than what it really is. So this is my first point. Now, the second point is about the predictions that uh, very soon depends on who is speaking and when they are speaking, but uh, AI is going to be so powerful that it's, you know, superhuman intelligence. Um, and then, uh, of course, putting humans in danger. Um, an example of this is uh, Zuckerberg. Uh, this is five years ago already. But then he said, over the next five to 10 years, we will get better than human level at all of the primary human senses, vision, hearing, language, general cognition. I mean, 10 years, so five years have passed. Um, now, personally, I mean, I think such a statement is totally ridiculous. Uh, this is ridiculous in, in, in several ways. Um, you know, part of it has to do with underestimation of the incredible capacity of the human mind, of the incredible complexity of language, of perception, uh, let alone general cognition. I mean, uh, it is like uh, not knowing about the complexity of the phenomena, you know, also in problem solving, for example, the things that we are able to do with our mind are just incredible compared to what we can do with machines. So if you think you can crack this problem, it seems to assume that you think that there's one idea, you know, one mechanism like uh, gravity or electricity or something like that, which is going to do the job. And, and I think this is just totally uh, underestimating the, the task, let's say. Now, even so, with what we have today, there's sort of two types of AI. There's uh, what I would call statistical AI. This is machine learning, uh, you know, using techniques from numerical analysis and all of that, uh, basically to um, uh, extract patterns from data. So the more data you have, the better you can do statistical AI, finding patterns, uh, and then doing categorization or prediction with them. So you can, for example, do this for language. You know, you put in vast amounts of uh, corpora of text, you extract patterns and you do pattern recognition uh, or prediction with, uh, with these statistical uh, models. Now, there's another kind of AI, which is, uh, you could say, more model-based AI. Uh, this is not models in the statistical sense, but in the real sense of, uh, like in scientific models. And for example, for the coronavirus, you know, you can approach this with 
looking for patterns in vast amounts of data and trying all sorts of things out of people and, and finding out whether they die or don't die or something like this. Or you can, like the way they did it, try to find the vaccine by actually understanding the molecular biology, understanding evolution, uh, understanding what would be possible to do to uh, make this virus um, no longer able to, to do what it is doing and to multiply in the cell. And so uh, this is a model-based approach. And so you have these two kinds of things in AI. Uh, you have the, the statistics is more associated with numerical AI, and then the model-based is more with symbolic AI. So in a not much, uh, sorry, uh, symbolic approach to language, for example, you would try to have grammars and you would try to do semantics and analysis and all of those things instead of pure statistics of stimulus response patterns. Now, both of these things have limitations and those limitations are actually unavoidable. I mean, they're epistemological. You can make as many regulations as you want. You cannot overcome the limitations that each of these methods has. Now, for statistics, I mean, every scientist learns about the limitations of, of statistics. For example, that if your data doesn't cover parts of, of your phenomena, then you will not be very good in prediction. Or if you don't have the outliers, outliers, well, you know, you cannot deal with them. I mean, this is common practice in, in science um, to use statistics in the proper way. But it's not the fault of statistics. I mean, you cannot, uh, you know, be more powerful than this particular method allows you to do. And so the kinds of things that we see these days, you know, these adversarial examples, right? Uh, you show uh, this, uh, this image here and, okay, revolver, great. But you, you tilt it slightly and, it, and the uh, deep learning network will say mousetrap or boathouse guillotine, you know, or uh, China and then, um, well, I can't read it myself actually. Uh, but so, so the, we know now that these uh, deep learning models are extremely brittle. It's enough to change one pixel and it doesn't work anymore. Uh, so they are not robust and they will never be. I mean, this is, this is the point, it's a statistical model. And so you can try to do as well as you can, but if in your data you don't have the uh, examples, you don't have the variations that you would have, you know, it's never going to, to be 100% accurate. Um, I mean, uh, is this uh, bad? Yes, it is bad. And actually, we have to realize that many applications of AI, the use of AI, we should take this into account and not ignore it. I mean, just to give one example, this is uh, for voice recognition. Uh, this is a paper that is showing uh, if you have a song like Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. I think it's by Simon and Garfunkel, but I'm not sure. Um, you can hide in this audio signal. You can actually hide an instruction which says deactivate security camera and unlock the front door. And the human would not be able to hear it. In fact, you can, uh, in, in the sounds, a spoken, uh, you know, sentence, so you can give instructions uh, that would cause a device with voice recognition like Alexa, which is in your living room, to do various kinds of things. So, and why is that? It's, it's again, it has to do with the statistical nature of deep learning and of the of neural network um, statistical machine learning. Um, now, I, I will have to ask you to uh, to hurry up. Uh, okay, okay. I will, just few. Yeah, I minutes. have an example of uh, use of AI in court because the the symbolic AI has also its own problems, you know. But I won't talk about that. I also want to conclude, and I won't go to that either. No. You know, I want to conclude by saying there is a fundamental problem in AI. There is an elephant in the room. And this elephant has to do with um, meaning and understanding. Uh, I'm going to run out of power, so my talk will uh, stop anyway very soon. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, we, we, have to, we have to get fundamental research to break through this wall of meaning. And so I just want to mention, we, we started recently a project called MUHAI, which is about meaning and understanding in human-centric AI or for human-centric AI, where we're actually trying to uh, look at how contextualized narrative networks could be built up by different sources uh, of information. And uh, I, this is my third, my final message, is that responsible AI, well, I would say responsible use of AI, I should have said, requires that we tackle the issue of meaning and understanding. Otherwise, we are not going to have explainability. We're not going to have a kind of robustness that we see in human uh, intelligence. Okay, sorry for being a little bit over time. That's, that's fine, Luke. It was a very interesting presentation. I'm sorry we couldn't hear all of it. Uh, you've been asked to share your, the full slides because the audience is also interested in, in the example you didn't mention. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks a lot. We, we need to move on directly to our next speaker who is from the Research Council of Norway, the Cecilia Matthiesen. Cecilia is a, is a senior advisor uh, at the Research Council you, and you have a doctorate in biochemistry. You work on making uh, responsible research and innovation concrete in nanotech and medical projects at the R RCN, the Research Council, and in European research and innovation funding collaborations. So you are the Council's representative in relevant area nets um, and Norway's expert representative in the future and emerging technologies part of the Norwegian Committee for Horizon 2020 and a delegate in FET flagships board of funders in Horizon 2020. So please Cecilia. Thank you and thank you for inviting me Elmarie. Uh, yes I'm definitely not an AI expert but I will talk about the experience I've had the last eight years or so uh, working with the integration of RRI for short uh, in funding and of research and innovation. I have uh, three main topics, um, the fundaments that you can build responsibility approaches on, uh, some examples from uh, RRI integration uh, and uh, for strong impact of that, and then uh, some good tools and outcome of the RRI request that we have done both nationally and in the uh, European Union. Cecilia, you're not sharing your presentation. Uh... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm very really sorry. I forgot to do that. Um, so uh, my first example is actually from my own institution, but it doesn't really matter if it's inside a research project or if it's in the network that you're working in, or if it's your institution. Uh, all, in all cases, you really need to have an understanding uh, uh, of an, a collaborative will to, to integrate the responsibility. Uh, this just shows how our strategy, you know, just published, uh, really build on the value of being responsible. And then when we work for a well-functioning research and innovation system in Norway, one of our five main uh, uh, things to work for is the ethical and uh, socially responsible research and innovation. So this is important, having a common understanding. And then um, other things uh, that is important is the understanding of responsibility or RRI as something that is developing and a continuous process going on. So you can't really answer in your proposal that this is what is responsible research and innovation and then not work with it anymore. You really have to discuss it all the way, what, what are these issues. Um, and then I have seen that it's also really important to have um, these discussions in a concrete scientific context. Uh, exactly like this uh, workshop is doing, discussing the responsibly uh, use or responsible AI. 
the next one. Uh, also, uh, this understanding of RRI as a developing process has been a long uh, time running in, in RCN. We established a framework in 2015, uh, inspired by other uh, research funding organization, uh, organizations, uh, and really see it as a process uh, where uh, the ability to look forward uh, being anticipatory, uh, think through, really being reflexive, to invite along uh, and being inclusive, inclusive in research and the processes, and then to work together and respond to the issues that we see. Um, an extreme of this could be an example taken from the Center of Digital Life, Norway. Uh, they actually took all the scientists in their network into a four days walk in the mountains, uh, discussing the aim of Digital Life Norway, which is to create economic, economic, economic uh, social and environmental value. And then they discussed this, what is the value? How do we value it? And how can uh, value be created and sustained by the biotechnology of the future? Um, of course, they didn't only go into the mountains in the Jotunheim. They also had lectures and conversations and so on. Uh, and, uh, but of course, it doesn't have to be this extreme. And I think workshops like this two hours on a digital meeting is also very worthwhile time spent on RRI. Next one. Okay, um, so how do we do this integration uh, to get the, an impact of RRI? Well, it is, uh, one thing is to put the RRI issue into a uh, common scientific platform. And I uh, have done this in several uh, situations. Uh, it's also good to include it in the calls that you put up for scientific proposals. Uh, and then the, the learning platforms can also be a very good solution. Uh, creating hubs where researchers, industry, the community and policy makers uh, meet and discuss. And it's not like you have just one solution, you can do all these things and they are equally important to do. So this is the example of uh, an internet I've been working in, yes, actually for eight years now, the Euro Nanomed internet. And I was responsible uh, to integrate RRI from 2016, approximately. Uh, approximately. Um, and RRI has really been cross-cutting our work as uh, network funding nanomedicine. Uh, we have published RRI guidelines and actually it was not planned in detail to do this when we started the network. It was something that we um, thought of as a good idea on the way. Um, we have, uh, as I said, all, uh, all the way discussed RRI in a thematic setting in the nanomedicine field, so in, a medical, in medical projects. And then we started to ask the proposers for get, uh, to the year um, uh, to, to do these RRI reflections. And then also we started to ask the evalu evaluators of um, of the projects to, to um, give their opinion or like include their view of, of how good, good it was to, based on their scientific experience. There was really no RRI experts in, their, in the evaluations. We had workshops and we monitor effects and we report and we disseminate what we do as I do now. So the next one. I also want to highlight the last version of the future and emerging technologies part uh, of the work program of Horizon 2020. 
where really uh, FET, in short, highlighted uh, the importance of RRI in all the calls they had in 2020. Uh, they highlighted it as an introductory text where shown here on this slide, but then they also specified it a little bit what they meant uh, in the thematic calls that they had in, uh, in FET Proactive. Uh, for those that are, <laughs> yeah, FET Proactive is no, now is EIC Pathfinder. Okay, so uh, challenges it's called. You will hear more about it, I guess, next speaker. Uh, next one, Elmarie. Yes, uh, again, this is um, another uh, way of how to integrate um, or set up competence hubs uh, and share knowledge of uh, how to integrate RRI. So Digital Life Norway, um, they have like the, the RRI as a cross-cutting and guiding um, topic in the whole network. Um, because this question goes beyond science and it uh, guides them what they do in this uh, network of uh, bio uh, bi biotechnology. Uh, they acknowledge that it, uh, biotechnology happens in society and that you really are, I should uh, then be basic for all of it. Uh, and they really think uh, they are mindful about the societal context that uh, they are in. So they create meetings and workshops um, and they ask the research projects to really implement their own commitments to responsible research and innovation. And that is really important, you know, it's not one solution for everybody, it's really to see, see what, what can this specific project do. And then they support uh, young researchers, uh, education and careers, and, and they really bring together the uh, life science so uh, scientists with social scientists in this network. Next one, please. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I wanted to mention the, um, just shortly from the last slide that uh, they had just had an RRI seminar uh, series uh, in Erico Biotech, which was really nice. And the link there was to that uh, seminar series with some nice talks in it about RRI. Okay, so then the next one. Uh, this is uh, a second example of uh, how you can work on integrating RRI. Uh, it's my Aeronet again, you're on Um So we used uh, a common meeting place, uh, established meeting place for our researchers uh, having been funded by the network. And then we really set up a co-creation process, uh, including RRI and nanomedicine scientists, uh, experts in our advisory board, peer review panel members, funding agencies, uh, representatives, uh, and they all uh, were included in, uh, in a workshop on RRI and uh, presenting outcome uh, on, on what, what is important when you try to do responsible nanomedicine research. And we used the output from the workshop and implemented it directly into our RRI guidelines for nanomedicine. And you have to follow the link on this slide to, to see the guidelines uh, on the web. They are out there. Uh, Celia, I will have, yeah. have to ask you to, to conclude in a minute or two. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, this is just my main points today. Uh, I. Uh, I think that it's important to invest in responsibility at all levels in the fundament of your research projects in scientific networks and organizations. You should uh, create learning arenas in the workshops or hubs and then share experience. And maybe you could just show one more slide on the sharing experience. So in the following slides here, you can see some good outcome of the RRI request that has been there in Horizon 2020 for, uh, and in funded projects. 
there are some tools that you can use to really try to identify your issues uh, in your research projects. And the last slide is just some national uh, funded AI projects, which is based in RRI. Hmm. Yeah, so this is the, the last slides here. And I'm sorry for not having the time to finish, but uh, um, yeah, if anything, I would like to point at the New Horizon project funded in uh, Horizon Europe. No, Horizon 2020 is a really, really good, uh, good RRI project, I think, from the SWAFS program. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. It's really good to hear about how the Research Council uh, integrates responsibility perspectives and practice, uh, and especially from the side of nano and, and medical research. Uh, and uh, stop share. And now um, that will also take us to the last speaker for today, who uh, is uh, Walter van de Velde from the European Innovation Council. Um, Walter also has a long experience in, uh, in uh, reflecting and, and practicing uh, responsibility approaches in research funding and, and Walter is originally an, a researcher in artificial uh, intelligence. Um, so you have experience from academia and industrial innovation. You've been working for the European Commission for a number of years. Uh, you're Deputy Head of Unit of the Future Emerging Technologies FET uh, Program and the EIC European Innovation Council Pathfinder. And uh, you are working currently these days, these weeks on how to, to design mm -hmm. the upcoming work program for the European Innovation Council for Europe. So thanks a lot for joining us in these busy times for you. Hello, nice to, to be here. Um, impressed by everything we've heard so far. And then as the last speaker, you always wonder, uh, what can I still say that will keep you uh, attentive? Um, so I am working for the European Innovation Council, or at least preparing it. This is a new initiative that uh, Europe will kickstart um, in 2021. So well, that's in a few weeks, basically. Um, and um, just a word about it maybe. So it's, it's a bit of an idealistic construction sometimes I think, but um, it's really to tackle head on this problem that we seem to have in Europe over and over again, that we have a fantastic research base, but the results of that research don't get to the market. And if at all they get to the market, it's usually not through European companies. And so we have really an innovation deficit as it's called, where we have um, this, this capital of, of knowledge and, and skills in the academic world and more broadly the research world that seems to have a hard time to get to big ticket successes if you want in, uh, in the marketplace. Um, so what we try to do is to integrate within a single new program, and that's the European Innovation Council, the whole path, if you want, from fantastic idea to a stage where you can attract investment, where you can grow a company and so on. And so we do that by building on a legacies that we have from, from previous uh, programs. And one was already mentioned, and it's the one where I've been working now for 15 years. It's called Future and Emerging Technologies, which is really an advanced research and technology program where we want to, to make sure that the lab-driven technology development uh, happens. So this is research that is far from the market. It's, uh, it's visionary stuff. It's high risk stuff. Um, the things that we will not see in the market probably in the next five or 10 years, but that have to be done now in order to get there in the future. So that's becoming in the EIC, the Pathfinder program. And that's gonna be linked to what is the new version of the SME scheme. And it's a totally different world of small, medium-sized companies where you're trying to build a program called the Accelerator that brings those results to a really growth phase. And in between, there is an enormous gap, and that's the problem that we are trying to solve as well. And for that, we have a transition program, which is not mentioned on this slide, but it will be in a few minutes, um, which is to make sure that this bridge between the Pathfinder and the Accelerator actually happens. Um, and I think that's, 
that's the main uh, difficulty of, of this this whole construction and we'll see we'll see how that works out now if you have a doubt of why this would be relevant for this particular uh, seminar i just need to quote one sentence from the advisory board's vision statement for this the eic will pioneer a distinctively european approach to support relevant innovations in a responsible and inclusive way that embraces european values and ethical standards so you see this is at the heart of eic is to do things in a responsible way now, this is always nice in policy documents. The difficulty which falls on the shoulders of us designing these programs then is to actually make sure that that trickles down into the reality of everything you do into your program. Every year you spend has to be in a, pro, in a project where these values are actually taken into account. And that is obviously a very difficult thing. And I think here we have to be quite humble um i don't think we have the solutions we had ex we have a lot of experience from the fed program as cecilia already said uh, where we have tried to integrate rri in a very deep way into the fed program so for the pathfinder i think we're relatively okay but how we're going to to to, to funnel that through to the stages of uh, transition and, and acceleration is uh, is still to be seen. I think we're in for a, a seven year long learning exercise, seven year being the, the length of the next uh, framework program starting next year. Um, just like Horizon 2020 was a learning program about innovation. I mean, FP, the, the previous framework program was still very much a research driven program only and in the horizon 2020 it took us seven years to get the word innovation seriously accepted into our projects and i think it will probably take us another seven years to get the next stages of doing this responsibly and so seriously integrated so this is all like rri itself it's a continuous process as cecilia also already mentioned it's something that we have to get through and hopefully do it right so I wanted to, well, in, in uh, the, the scope of the EIC, I should say, is, is deep tech in general. Deep tech being understood as lab-driven science to technology innovation. Um, and AI is a prime example, not because of the word deep, but because it's one where you're out of the market very quickly if you don't keep yourself being fed by the latest in research. So you need a new kind of circle, I mean, a new kind of interaction between the research and the, the, the use phases to, to keep this going. And that's, I think, an essential feature of, of deep, deep tech. So um, this links then to the AI part of this talk, uh, a field that I know uh, well from, from my previous life as a, as a researcher. And on the bridge, I did projects in the FED program on this type of uh, uh, topic. So I, I know this, this sites uh, from different angles. So I think there are three routes to this responsible AI. And I take Luke's uh, point that responsible AI is, can be misread as something else, but by now you know what, what we mean here in this context. So one is methods and practices, and Cecilia has already done a very good work, uh, work in explaining a lot of that stuff. The second one is regulatory frameworks, and there I had a fantastic introduction of uh, Virginia, who is really working in the high-level expert group, uh, has been working in the high-level expert group to get that angle fleshed out. And then I think a topic that we then sometimes tend to forget is that maybe we should also try to influence the AI research agenda itself. And I call it here now of a term that I invented this morning, different AI as a label of something else that maybe we should be doing as a goal for, for artificial intelligence. Given that the time is running short and that the first two topics have been covered already quite well, I will try to jump quite quickly to a to this different AI, because I think that's maybe where there are some more original thoughts. Um, anyway, very quickly on this first route, methods and practices, in the FET program, and the quote below is uh, the copy, a copy of uh, the work program that Cecilia already referred to, um, you see that we have tried to do this seriously and the way it works out in practice is that you want your projects to, do, to be quite visionary, again, visionary should not be confused with with 
telling a tale or telling uh, just a, a story that, that can go way beyond where you will actually get in your project. So there's a careful balance there. Um, anticipatory reflection and engagement. Interdisciplinarity, I think this is absolutely key. If you work just in your own discipline, you will never have the broad views that you need for a real RRI approach. Very important, I think, and very difficult in most projects is this shortcutting the TRL ladder, TRL being technology readiness level. So in, in research of technology research, if you know this, 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 this framework of TRLs, you have very low TRL levels, one, three, four maximum. Yeah? And that's typically where the Pathfinder or FET uh, sits. But if you want to do RRI, you have also to be able to to, to trial some things, to test things, to very quickly get feedback. And so you jump in a way to TRL9, because in TRL9 is when you really do things for real with real users and so on. And you use that experiment as a way to couple back to TRL1 to 4, back to the research. And I think it's this, this coupling of these two extremes in the TRL ladder that is very essential for deep tech. It's this cycling back between the, the research, using it, and so on. And this leads, in a way, to a new alliance between the research industry and society. You need to have the, the rights to do this. And for the moment, we don't have that in order at all. The big technology firms, they play with our rights when they do that. They, we are, as citizens, almost a constant subject of experiment with their technologies, right? And that has to become much more transparent and much more clear to everybody what is going on there. And I think previous speakers have uh, largely uh, talked about that. Um, well, this is some recent topics in FET that we have uh, tried to apply this to, and uh, not just in the general statement, as I said there, but also really concretely developing the RRI dimension in the context. I think of topics like socially interactive technologies, which is a bit, bit like uh, the news uh, site that we heard about before. Um, artificial intelligence for extended social interaction, which is extended reality for mass social interaction is also a, a big uh, problem where a lot of deep fakes and things like that become uh, become imp important and, and so on. So uh, environmental intelligence is another one where you see the, li the limits really of our own views of, of artificial intelligence, but also how AI can help to alleviate some of these uh, difficulties that we have with those uh, media. Um, I'm going to skip this one. I will go directly now to the routes to responsible AI, the second one, which is the regulatory framework. We have already heard from Virginia all the work of the high-level expert group, the, com the commission communication, the white paper that just came out uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, and I, I call these uh, bullets from the communication for me that captures what human-centric AI is all about. So trying to do things in certain ways to respect the role of human agency and oversight, the technical robustness and the safety and so on. Um, so to not to forget about societal and environmental well-being, accountability and so on. So these are features that we are trying to operationalize somehow and the white paper is the next step to that um, to make sure that AI that is accredited if you want as being positive AI um, should uh, take those things seriously into account and there is then a way to kind of make sure that that happens by having a, a tick, tick boxes if you want that are actually operationalized in a concrete uh, testing scenario that you deal well with the training data that the data and record keeping is in order that there is a set of a minimum set of information to be provided to users that they know what game they are playing with the technology and so on. So this is all in the making. Um, I'm, I'm not involved in that myself directly, but now and then I get phone calls saying, what do you think about it? So then I, I give my opinion. Um, I think the commission is there doing a good job, a bit like GDPR. We are at the forefront of trying to do something that nobody else is trying to do. And I, I, I hope that again, we can make a, a good mark or, Maybe if I should say we can make a better mark than with GDPR uh, for the, the AI context there. 
but the, the, the last route yeah, in, yes no. i will i will this is only two slides to go the last route i think is that we should also from the ai research field think a bit of what we're doing i mean what we're currently doing with with deep learning and everything and it seems that the whole of ai is being reduced to that is simply not good enough and i i predict that it's going to be a footnote in the history of ai it's got, it has been a major breakthrough, but it's not an end point or anything. And it's not what AI is all about. Luke was also very clear about that. There is so much more to do in AI. And the agenda, the agenda of 20 years ago was much richer than it seems to be now in artificial intelligence research. And I think that's a pity. We have to somehow go back, but in a different context, because we are learning a lot. So the definition of the high-level expert group, I'm not going to read it to you, but is this good enough, Mike? The answer is no, this is not good enough. It sees AI as a problem solver. And I think that's not what it is supposed to do if we're talking about responsible AI. I had a call that I, I wrote a couple of years ago for the FED program. The title was Knowing, Doing, Being. I think the history of AI is one of knowing, symbolic AI, uh, knowledge-based systems. It became a technology for doing, where we had the robots coming in, the sub-symbolic systems also doing that, being much better in driving those physical, physical artifacts. But we have never been at the level of being. We are human beings. We are not human doings. So there is something more there in the being. And I think uh, on the last slide is my, my current thinking, and I, this, is, this is just the thought of the day almost, but... I think we need to, to look at AI differently and start reshaping drastically the research agenda that we're into. And the reasons are the, for the first bullets there. Humans, we have always been working with things and creatures that are better than ourselves, stronger, faster, more precise, more patient, more knowledgeable. And AI will not be different. We will be working with AI that is better than ourselves. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. We are surrounded by many things though that are better than ourselves, but in different ways. Plants, the immune system, ant colonies, the evolution mechanisms, biotopes, the microbiome in our belly, all of those things, they do amazing things of a kind of an intelligence that is not ours. It's a very different thing. And we, as humans, are not good at grasping that kind of intelligence that requires a different connection to the world than the one that we have through our sensors. And we are not good in dealing with scale and complexity in space and time. The thing like the, the COVID crisis, climate change, it's beyond our grasp. Right? And so by having this emphasis all the time on a human-centric approach, I think we may be limiting ourselves unnecessarily in what we're trying to do with AI. And so one idea is that we should look at what I call here donut intelligence. It is the, the donut is taken from the donut economics, where you say that we should think of economic models that keep us, our society, within this just and safe space which is the green uh, circle on the screen that, that you see. So, and for me, I think we need to, th we could think about AI or about intelligence in general as what people do and systems do to keep us there. That is what real intelligence is. It's not solving a problem. It's solving problems within this bigger picture of the, the, the safety conditions within which a species can thrive. Right? And so as a first practical step, I think we could use the European AI on demand platform um, as a way to host or register AI applications into such a donut scheme. So they, it would be kind of a repository of AI techniques and applications, and maybe an obligatory pass-through for any AI applications that would make explicit what those influences are within that donut scheme that, that, that I'm uh, referring to here. And then for the long-term AI research agenda, I think this could be a different angle to consciousness research, which for me is one of the next steps in, in the AI research agenda. It's as a way to take into account the way we or any intelligence is anchored in a bigger picture. So the real vision of, of broad consciousness of not ju just doing things in isolation of a context, but and not just the context of the here and now as we humans are very used to, to deal with, but also the broader context of of the planet, which is obviously relevant in the, in the current context and so on. So this is just one idea. I'm sure there are many others, but it's to open up a door of really don't get stuck with AI in the current hype and 
think beyond and I'm afraid that the group of people thinking beyond is, is diminishing because there is a big historical legacy of things that we've did years ago and that tends to be forgotten now. And so this is a plea to go back to some of those basics that were so exciting in those days. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. A very interesting presentation, both uh, of the European Innovation Council and also of these other ideas. Um, <clears throat> so with this, I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, extremely uh, interesting presentations and they fit very well together. And uh, with this, I, I'm sure there are lots of comments uh, from the other speakers and maybe also from the audience. So I'll leave now the moderation over to Alex. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah, I think we have 20 minutes left, a uh, few minutes uh, less than expected, but for a two-hour event, I suppose, we're still almost uh, punctual in a German sense. So is there anything immediately that the speakers would like to um, add to what has been said? We should make this probably very short so that we have enough time for discussions, uh, discussion about the questions from the from plenary, the virtual plenary, of which there are quite a few. Max, do you want to... Um, yeah, yeah, I'd love, love to comment on some really, really interesting things that Luke said. And uh, I think uh, it's so important that we look beyond the problems to the, to the symptoms the, and the symptoms to the causes. So I completely agree with you, Luke. It's just so irritating to see ridiculous British tabloid media stories about Terminators and ridiculous portrayals from Hollywood that make us worry about the wrong thing. Um, but that is not the fundamental problem, that's a symptom, I think, of, of uh, what machine learning algorithms have done. Because why is it that the Sun and other newspapers keep getting trashier and trashier and take, getting a larger and larger market share? It's because most people don't subscribe to the Sun. They click on the Sun. They find, that out, find out about it from Facebook and other social media. And these sort of really trashy stories get amplified by the machine learning algorithms, right? Not because Mark Zuckerberg is a bad person. He's a nice guy who wanted to make the world better, but because these algorithms have these unintended consequences. And also, I completely agree with you. I mean, I'm on what you said. I, mean, I, I think I share your negative views on Donald Trump, but I don't think Donald Trump is, you, you said that Donald Trump and the Republican Party are what's the threat to democracy. I think the threat comes from a deeper place. I, I feel that uh, Trump is not the cause, he's, he's a symptom. He, he was the first politician to really master the exploitation of filter bubbles in the West. And this was very much the key to his victory, right? And we see both on the left and on the right, ever more political polarization and skilled politicians, who, the ones who master this the most, uh, with populism and, and, and unscientific... Uh, strategy, they, they get very popular. So um, I, I hope we can um, look beyond the, 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 the first things that strike us as problematic and really go after the root cause and make sure that the AI itself is deployed as a tool that strengthens rather than weakens democracy. Thank you, yeah. Um, closing the loop to the keynote, so to speak. Any immediate responses to that or shall we go to audience questions? No, I think I, I agree with Max and also this uh, system that you have built, you know, which is a way to use AI for, let's say, counteracting the manipulations that some others are using AI for. But I would still insist that we have to hold the people to account for, you know, the use of AI. I think that's also in, in some of the other talks um, because if we say it's, it's, it's the AI, then we, we, we do some extent, you know, we give the responsibility is away from the people, right? They can't help it. Uh, but anyway, let, let's look at, at here some from the other people in the audience to, to other questions, but I don't think we are that far apart. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Unless there is anything, uh, um, more urgent, let's, let's dive into some questions right away. Um, by the way, we've, we have had uh, about 140 participants in case that wasn't displayed. A few people have come and left um, during the time. 
I suppose it's almost mathematically prescribed, so to speak, to, to start with question zero, which has been um, discussed in the chat. So from asking what we can do with AI to the question, what should, uh, how should and should we be regulating it? Or, and that question has also been asked, is it actually our legal system maybe, um, and maybe even our value systems that need adjustment to the new technological age? So are we thinking it in the wrong way, which of course is more provocation than a question, I suppose. So let's maybe therefore ask the panel, the, the policy zero question, who shall decide? Exactly. Yeah, I think it's indeed the, the question minus one, maybe. It's who are we? Because we talk all the time about we should and we uh, need to be involved. And, but who, is, who needs to be involved? How do, do we are going to involve all those people? Who decides who is going to be involved? I think those are the questions where we need to start. Yeah, any further thoughts from the others? I, I completely agree with this. I would just add that the, it's not like if society does not put effort into better education and, and, and so on, like nothing is happening. Because of course, there are all incredibly powerful forces out there already, commercial forces and political forces, constantly trying to educate us to believe their take on, on reality. And I would very much like to see democracy fight back against this by, by um, democratic institutions taking a stronger role in, in education. And, and yeah, which reflects the discussion we've seen in the chat on, on education as well and on, on power. One of the participants asked whether AI can be expected to reinforce current power distribution or whether it can actually have a better potential to change that, to, um, to horizontalize those hierarchies uh, of knowledge, for example. And uh, so is our democracy healthy enough to take that medicine, that technological medicine, um, Max has already spontaneously responded quite skeptically in the chat. He said, well, probably more than former. Um, how about the others? Um, how optimistic, how, yeah, how optimistic are you? AI is a tool. That's what Luke already said. And it's up to us to use this tool in one way or another. So it's not up to AI to, to, uh, to, to take the decisions or to, to shape, uh, it's as we are using AI to shape, to take decisions and so on. It's uh, what I often uh, say is with AI, we can get a lot of answers, but it's still we, and again, the, the, who are we? Uh, but we are the ones who really need to ask the questions, uh, ask the right questions, because uh, that's when the tool can really empower us. And I really agree with uh, Max on uh, seeing that we, I would also really like to see democracy taking the, um, the, the lead on, this, uh, on the, these issues. But it's at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's about us. It's not about the, the technology. If you're really, yeah, or Luke, yes. you yes. raised your hand, yeah. Yeah, um, I think the uh, something in, you know, there are a lot of issues that uh, Walter put on the table. Um, but the, the crucial issue, I think, is that in Europe, uh, we now are being overwhelmed by um, American technology with its American value systems. And, uh, you know, the, the, the response to it, uh, of course, we can make regulations to hold it back a little bit, but you know, we, we see that this is not really enough. I think we have to, if we don't create our own, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, technology industry for AI, but uh, for computing in general, but particularly for AI, then uh, we cannot impose our own value system because we will be overwhelmed, you know, as is the case today. And so there should be alternative, uh, alternatives in one way or another. Uh, now, we're late in the game, you know. Uh, I mean, I've been in AI since the 70s. And uh, I can tell you, it has always been an incredible struggle to convince uh, funding, to get funding for AI, and which has flipped from it, it's not good for anything, it's not scientific, it's not this, it's not that, you know, and now suddenly it, it, it is going to, to, 
destroy or to save the world, whatever you, you have in mind. So, um, you know, and, and this is the problem in my view that the Pathfinder uh, goals are related also to the, the, um, the responsibility of uh, responsible use of AI. But you see, as long as we are so dependent on, on American technology with its American value system, we cannot, we cannot do anything. Uh, we need to uh, build our own European uh, answers, let's say, which have the functionality and which are good. They're, they're chosen not because they have some label on it, uh, but because they are, uh, they are better uh, for the users. And they, it, the users are the ones that are choosing, right? And so, and so this is the real challenge before us. And when it comes to the European dimension, I suppose Walter will now try to convince us that the EIC is coming to the rescue when it comes to the European well, position. Or Yes, um, convincing you will be difficult. Uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so we'll see in a couple of years. But uh, Luc, Luc is, is right to point out that the, the current technological infrastructure of, of Internet, World Wide Web, and all the, the, the big players of the United States that are on there is a very simple platform to bring things to mass use very quickly. And we simply don't have that kind of power in Europe to do that. So. This is why we have in, in at the European scale these initiatives like Gaia X now, for instance, to develop an open an, an open data infrastructure for Europe. And but also there we immediately see the infiltration of the big players from the US. So uh, it's going to be a very difficult thing. The, the the EIC gamble is one to start from bottom up and to grow small companies to create their own ecosystems around new players and trying to kind of uh, turn from there. It will take time, but we have a lot of resources as we hope and uh, we, I think we, we can do some, something there. But getting these early tests done and then having a quick buy-in to grow into a real valid experiment is, is going to be a, a big challenge. Yeah? But it's, it's, it's worth trying. Mm. So, any further thoughts directly to that? I think it was Virginia who just um, also said uh, uh, kind of it's just a tool AI, just a tool, I think it has also been mentioned in the chat that uh, this might be reflecting to quite some extent uh, technological deterministic viewpoint, probably meant here as opposed to social constructivism, I guess. So are there maybe any thoughts as to whether we are too de deterministic in our understanding as to this is what's happening anyway, and we need to regulate it, or is there a more democratic bottom-up um, function in uh, socially constructing the technologies we're uh, visioning, which I think was the term. I don't used. think those two things are uh, in opposition at all. I think that we use the, uh, the way we use the tools constructs the way our societies are and our so social uh, fabric also determines how we are using and shaping the tools. So there is not a one, one side and the other, but it's really a continuous. And it's not like uh, tools are by definition deterministic. So we really need to take a different approach to what, what is a tool, but, uh, and how, how are we uh, understanding and, uh, and for that we really have to to move away from the idea that AI is part of the engineering science or is part of the computer science. AI is really a multidisciplinary and that was at the beginning and the, the, the 80s and the 70s and before we really were looking at AI from a much more multidisciplinary approach and we need to mm -hmm. move there again. It's not just about yeah, building absolutely. the stuff because we can, but it's about understanding what is this stuff that we are building, why are we building it and how is this changing our uh, our lives and our uh, ourselves and there we need the humanities and the social science i think a mistake that europe is making also it's, <clears throat> is that we're not supporting big europe is not supporting its big uh, it companies politically the way that america and, and china are you know if it's not just money here like when europe says okay we need google and facebook to pay and apple to pay taxes in europe more America will immediately threaten it with a trade war and, and massive tariffs on French wine and so on. And then the European Union backs down, right? Whereas Europe does not do the, the opposite. 
Uh, when America comes to, and says, hey, you Europeans, you have to stop, uh, get your uh, total petroleum, get us, stop doing business in Iran because Trump <laughs> went out of the pre trade deal. The Europeans are just like, okay, we're just going to let our <laughs> Or now America is saying, you know, European companies have to stop building a German Russian gas pipeline. So America can, uh, and Europe is like, okay, maybe we'll go along. Yeah. Europe never really pushes back, even though Europe has a larger GDP than America does, right? I think if, if Europe wanted to, they could insist. We hear it here's a new GDPR. Uh, no companies can send email between Europeans if the data in any way it might leave Europe, you know, that would give a huge advantage to European competitors to Google and Facebook, right? Uh, but, but Europe is, it does not ever take those fights the way America I does. Think, I think you are right, but then we would lose the, the excuse that we have nowadays. We, we always can hide behind the fact that the Americans are doing it uh, and the, the Chinese are against us, so that we wouldn't have that excuse anymore. But what do we, so what we, really need, we would really need to take the initiative and take the, the, the empowering our, ourselves and it is somehow the European uh, strategy, not, not only now, but since, uh, since we start the uh, uh, going and invading other parts of the world is uh, to uh, put the blame somewhere else. But what does Europe really want? A good outcome or good excuses? That, that I wonder sometimes, yeah. It's easier to, to hide behind the excuses because then we don't really have to, uh, to be a, a player in the, determining the good outcome. And I, I'm really being serious. We really are uh, much more concerned with uh, being sure that we have a good excuse than that we really have the responsibility. And if we talk about responsibility, that's it. We need, really need, as Euro Europe, to take the responsibility for, uh, for our own role in the, in the, in all, in the whole thing. I think that the wind is changing a bit, though, now. The whole uh, discussion on European sovereignty in technology is much higher on the agenda than it has ever been. The talk of uh, Bre Bre Commissioner Breton is becoming much more uh, demanding in that. And there's a bit of a conflict in the commission between Vestager and Breton in how to play this exactly. But it's clear that this, um, this debate are, is, is now You are right, table. but so we have I, 500 years of I hope. Use. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, say two things. One is indeed, you know, as, as Max has pointed out, maybe in, um, I would say, 1980s, early 90s, there was still an opportunity, I mean, like the, the World Wide Web was, after all, was started up in a European network of physics labs associated with the seven in, in Geneva. And uh, so, but at some point, you know, the technology is there and then it becomes a power game. And this is a game that the scientists cannot, cannot play. I mean, which maybe Europe has, uh, does, has not dared to play enough. Um, but it's true, as, as uh, Walter was saying, uh, Breton and others, they are finally beginning to see that, you know, if you play it the way it was in the past, very friendly, cooperative, um, you know, the, I mean, like uh, European funding, like uh, ERC and so on, was more spending almost, I, I'm exaggerating now, more money on countries outside of the EU, and now we, we have to take the UK as part of outside of the EU, you know, um, than then on, on their own countries. So there's always this, this inclusive thinking, like, like uh, universal, we are all friends, but the others don't think that way. I mean, they don't think that way in China. And so the Chinese, they have constructed alternatives to Google and to email and to... Uh, social media and do all of these things, right? And so there needs to be, if we want an, uh, an industry, a European AI industry that is up to the task, which is one of the questions asked by the organizers, you know, that there has to be assertive, both in, in terms of power and then in terms of um, working together, actually, and believing in our possibilities. It's a lot like uh, I remember very well that uh, when there were good students in the, um, let's say, uh, 80s or 90s, they say, oh, we have a great student here. Uh, we should, 
you know, we should keep him. Then they say, oh, we should send them to America. And indeed, then, you know, some of the best students, they are now at MIT, for example, <laughs> or, or in... in uh, <laughs> it's here, I think. <laughs> no, no, the, but you but see, it, it's this mentality that we should send away our best because we don't believe enough in ourselves. And so this, this whole attitude has to change uh, at all levels. I mean, we cannot blame this or that. It's not the European Commission who has to do this, you know, it's a collective um, attitude that has to change and that otherwise we are just being swept away. Every day we, for AI, Europe gets further behind. I mean, that, that is clear. If you're in the field and you see the massive investments by companies in particular, you know, then the, the, this is a, a sort of, uh, maybe it's difficult to put into words, but the train is now going, it's a TGV train, right? With the grand vitesse, it's, it's going forward at, a, at an enormous pace. And so we are there like uh, uh, racing with, with, with trains that go at 20 kilometers per hour against the others who go at uh, 200 kilometers per hour. So. Yeah, and, and talk, talking of grand vitesse, Luc, I think in terms of um, speed and timing, we may need to start wrapping up, but there's one colleague here who hasn't contributed, hasn't had the opportunity to contribute actually to that final panel. Cecilia, I saw you, you um, react a few times and then you were probably too polite to interrupt everyone else because we were so engaged. Is there anything that you would want to say as a final wise piece of um, advice or in our analysis for uh, the panel? And then I would try to wrap up with. Yeah, there's so many big questions being raised, uh, so many challenges. So that's a bit uh, difficult maybe, but I think it was good uh, what you said in the end here. Look, we need to do this together uh, as a society, as a democracy as human beings. So just summing up what I picked up from many of the talks, uh, not like leaving it to, to others, being engaged and doing it together. That's my final comment. Yeah, and there would have been so much more also in the comments and in the chat as to what does engagement actually mean um, is democracy actually more than just engaging people um, bringing us back to the power question and so on. So I, I personally also took uh, away a lot from this session. We're going to share the recording on YouTube. That's the plan and uh, follow up with a bit of uh, further conversation in the public. Um, uh, if I may just quickly wrap it up in a minute. Um, from my perspective, uh, our keynote speaker I'm tempted to take the liberty to use your, your ACA of Mad Max here, Rem reminded us that AI, just as almost every other technology, neither is inherently good or inherently bad, but it's instead pivotal to focus on actual root causes of those socio-technical challenges and not on the symptoms that we might actually be looking and asking the wrong questions. Um, which is then where Luke came in and said that he, he emphasized that we will need to focus on um, uh, like AI, instead of expecting responsible technology as such, more of um, how to use um, it responsibly, for instance, by insisting on higher accuracy, higher robustness of the technology, that is a prerequisite. Uh, Virginia Dignam then therefore thankfully reminded us of the challenge of putting all those, let's say, free range eggs into one basket, uh, illustrating the need to consider certification if uh, uh, in addition to just self-regulation self -regulation of the industry. And uh, Cecilie and uh, Walter illustrated the challenges of integrating all of this, um, as it's been said, these big questions into something very profane as science policy and funding in the end, with citizens being at the moment very much subject to a social experiment, which is obviously what none of us wants. And then Walter's three roots maybe as a final laws towards responsible artificial intelligence in a sense of knowing, doing, and being, I think it was, with an emphasis on the latter. First, that technocratic dimension of governing the technology in an anticipatory way. Second, uh, this um, towards a more regulatory, regulatory framework. 
as discussed in the high level expert group where we could have this wonderful exclusive insight with Virginia sharing her thoughts. And thirdly, striving to influence the very research agenda from a citizenry, if you want, um, itself towards a better AI to embrace the opportunities and control for the risks. And all of that, of course, is a bit of a challenge. So I suppose this is not going to be the last meeting and the last webinar we're going to have on that. Unless, Alan, you want to have the final, final word. We agreed that you probably <laughs> wouldn't need to, but um, I'm happy to hand over to the person to whom we owe this webinar and the project as such. Alan, I will force back. And from my side, thank you very much for joining us and for all those people joining in and discussing with us today. Yeah, thank you, uh, Alex. Nice, uh, nice summary. No, I don't have anything to add. Uh, we can just say that we will send out an email to everyone tomorrow with the link to the to the recording, so you can listen and, and watch us, watch it again if you want, and uh, distribute if you want that. So, um, and uh, with that, yeah, thanks a lot to all the speakers. Again, it's been uh, excellent, uh, and uh, I've learned a lot and enjoyed very much the discussions and, and thanks to the audience as well uh, for uh, for attending the seminar i hope also you enjoyed it and it looks from some of the chat messages that you have and you found it engaging so yeah thanks thanks to everyone and uh, we, we've now thanked everybody except two people so on behalf of all the speakers i, I would <laughs> like to thank our wonderful hosts here Ellen Marie and Alexander for making this all happen. Thank you. Okay. Indeed. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you all. Thank you. Perfectly done. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Cheers. <laughs>